Here we are at Plant and Animal Genome 2015, and the question we're asking you today is, how do you deal with a problem of missing data? Well, James, thank you for a great talk. It was very interesting to hear about your latest high-Q data on the proton. But to back up a little bit, can you tell me about this sort of work you've done with maize and with this interesting millet species? Oh, absolutely. So uh, the method I was talking about called uh, tunable genotyping by sequencing is a method uh, where we target many fewer sites in the genome than conventional genotyping by sequencing. Uh, now, we were just talking about missing data. So with conventional GBS, you target about a million sites in the genome, you generate about a million reads. So many sites have only one read, many sites have zero reads. So you've got missing data, and you often can't deal well with heterozygosity without a lot of imputation. So what we're doing is narrowing it down and targeting many fewer sites and generating many reads per site, which allows us to call heterozygosity accurately. It means we have many fewer sites with no reads or too few reads to call heterozygous or homozygous accurately. And to be clear, this tunable genotyping by sequencing is your, uh, one of your two hats. Yes. And that was the yeah. data to bio hat. Yeah. Is that, so that, that is my uh, corporate hat. And yeah. then I also have the, the academic hat. Sure. So the, what I was talking about in the academic hat was this uh, prozo millet, which is a uh, cold and drought tolerant species we grow out in western Nebraska where a lot of stuff won't grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, backing up regarding the tunable genotyping by yeah. sequencing, you had some early data around HiQ and Proton. Can you elaborate uh, yeah. on that a little bit? Uh, absolutely. So the, the, because we are targeting these fewer number of sites and we have many reads per site, it allowed us to look at the, the error rate for uh, indels much more effectively than we could otherwise without generating enough data to resequence the whole genome. So what we found when we looked at the high Q versus the previous version 3 reagents is that the number of uh, deletions, missed bases, and sequencing was cut almost in half. And that wow. turned out to actually be an understatement of the case because we were, were looking at the aligned reads that aligned to the genome to call these errors. And the proportion of reads that aligned with high confidence to only a single location in the genome had increased by 25% from the V3 to the high Q. So not only you had an increase or a decrease in the error and the number of sort of accurate genotypes, you also had 25% more sites to look at. Uh, more, more reads to more align reads to the genome. So, because they were aligning better. Right. So actually what we'd probably do is put more samples into a lane now because once we have enough reads per sample, it doesn't actually provide us with a lot more benefit to have more reads. And you had a, some really nice bar charts that showed graphically that more than two-fold difference. Yeah. 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 And then as far as uh, this particular sort of low missing data problem, yeah. it is prevalent. Just because of the reasons that you mentioned. Yeah. People are doing rad sequencing, they're not getting enough read depth to cover yeah. those regions right. by using tunable GBS on top of HiQ. Yes, so then when what you're doing is you're targeting the exact same sites over and over again, which is great when you move from one population to another, and you can discover these new markers as you move. Uh, but I mm -hmm. probably, you're going to point out, I mean, this, this works from you know, sort of a thousand markers on up. At the lower end, it's really interesting what you guys are doing with AmpliSeq with uh, a few hundred markers that you can genotype over and over again with uh, targeted rather than randomly distributed across the genome. But from the discovery point of view, it's yeah having that much larger, twice as large pool oh, of variants yeah. to choose from. Absolutely, and being able to look at lots and lots of individuals. A lot of people when they talk about discovery are still, you resequence four or five individuals, you find some SNPs, and a lot of those will turn out not to be very informative. Whereas with this, you can get the rare SNPs that are present only in certain subpopulations. Interesting. Now to move on to the prosomillet, this is a not, you mentioned an orphan type yeah. of genome. So it's, it's interesting, it's an orphan crop that's actually grown in the U.S. So there are, uh, what is it, I think about uh, five million acres grown every year of prozo millet out in western Nebraska and Colorado, but there's no breeding, there's, or there's one breeder, there's no molecular markers, none of the modern technology that's been applied to crops like maize and soybean and have brought the yields up so far. So it's really great to actually start bringing these new technologies into crops that haven't benefited really from the breeding revolution at this point. And then what did you find out in terms of looking at that? Well, so the thing that we found out was everyone had talked about prozo millet having very low diversity. It turns out it has gone through uh, multiple bottlenecks. So it was domesticated in China. Uh, the Chinese lines were brought to Europe, which only a subset of the diversity came from there. And only a small sm subset of the European lines came to the U.S. in the 1850s with uh, colonists. So when we were trying to breed in the U.S., we're not using any of that diversity. Now we have those markers, we can start to bring in a lot of diversity from all over the world to improve the U.S. varieties. 
and some really nice data from different geographies that clustered very nicely together. Uh, yeah, so it showed that there was a lot of structure in the data. If you look at Indian lines, all the Indian lines are much more similar to each other than to lines from anywhere else in the world. The same for lines from China or Korea. And similarly in sort of Europe and Russia, although those lines do cluster with the U.S. So that one breeder in the U.S. has a lot more to choose from, is that correct? Exactly, exactly. And a lot more tools to help him pit, decide what to choose. And that was another interesting point in terms of the different phenotypes, even though it has this low diversity. Right, and if you look at the lines that are grown in the U.S., they are, uh, the structure all looks very, very similar. So that diversity we're seeing is in the worldwide germplasm, but not in the U.S. germplasm so far. I see. Well, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity.